Researchers in quantitative biomodeling use powerful computers and mathematics to better understand how different biological systems work. It's an example of successful research collaboration between Stockholm University, Sweden's Royal Institute of Technology, KTH, and Karolinska Institutet. Traditionally, this has really been three separate universes. We've had the Royal Institute of Technology with all the engineering aspects, Stockholm University with, should you say, the traditional science faculty, basic research in biochemistry. And then, of course, the Karolinska Institute has traditionally had all medical applications and everything, and we've been somewhat isolated from each other. What's happened the last 10 years, though, is that suddenly all these three universities are moving to the same pivoting point here with a wider form of life science aspect. So from traditionally having to be in completely separate areas, we now have people like me. I'm an engineering physicist by training from the Royal Institute of Technology. I'm working at Stockholm University in a biochemistry department, but many of the problems we're actually facing are very medically related, so ion channels and what's happening in disease. So I'm not sure. Right now we're at the point where we're collaborating. Uh, come back in 10 years and we might very well be a single university. In quantitative biomodeling, computer simulations are made of the nerve paths in the brain to learn more about the brain's memory function. We are using uh, computers here, exclusively computers and mathematics, to try to help understand uh, the brain and how the brain functions. With today's capacity, we are able to simulate uh, at least at some pace uh, the mouse brain or the rat brain. Uh, and, and with future computers in maybe 10, 20 or even longer time, we will be able to probably to simulate networks, neural networks of this size. And since we learn more and more about how the brain is organized and how the different components work, we will in those, at that time, we will probably have very good models of the brain, actually, and we will understand much better the principles, how it operates, and what goes wrong when, when you get diseases. Once we have done, have understood that much of, of how the brain works, then we can perhaps also build machines, build chips and, and computers that are much more like the brain. Another research group is building three-dimensional molecule models in supercomputers to contribute to more efficient production of medicines in the future. Researchers also depend on the help of hundreds of thousands of private individuals across the world. The fascinating thing with computers, although it is a model, but given this model, I, as I said, I can literally see the atoms, how they are moving, how they are interacting. So in one way it's super concrete, although we are extremely limited by the amount of available computing power. What this enables us to do is, for instance, if you're designing a uh, new pharmacological molecule, I can literally both see and calculate exactly how a molecule is interacting with a protein, how it might bind, could I redesign this molecule to fit in another way. Um, so we certainly have our fair share of challenges, but I think this is developing into a new complementary method, just like we already have a wide range of experimental techniques, studying proteins in computers will 10 years from now be very standard. Most of the things we do, since it's so computationally intensive, we tend to use lots of supercomputing power, both in Sweden and abroad. Uh, the problem with supercomputers, although even if they're among the 100 fastest machines in the world, they might contain 1,000 or 10,000 computers. But each of those computers aren't really that much faster than the ones you might have under your desks. So the challenge there, if we now want to take this one, two, three, or four orders of magnitudes further, um, we, first we have to find ways there are no computers in the world that are that fast. But can we use more than one computer? And this is something that we've done in collaboration with uh, colleagues at Stanford University running the Folding at Home project, which has worked amazingly well. So instead of running things on a supercomputer, we are running our simulations on hundreds of thousands, both PlayStations and personal computers as screensavers. So although it is a bit untraditional, this gives us roughly two orders of computing power more than anyone else in the world has access to, which enables us to do completely new designs and simulation studies in the field.